Next up will be uh, J.C. Coffee. I've uh, known J.C. for a good number of years, uh, strong and uh, frequent supporter of uh, AVSI uh, uh, conferences. Uh, J.C. has uh, been working over the last uh, several years in environmental um, detection and uh, capturing uh, important information from the environment in support of uh, uh, NOAA primarily. Um, JC currently is the Director of Unmanned Systems, uh, Cherokee Nation Technology. It supports uh, the National Oceanographic and uh, Atmospheric Association Administration, excuse me, uh, NOAA. Uh, their UIS program and several other interagency organizations. He holds a, a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Notre Dame, an MBA from Embry-Riddle, a master's certification in government contracting from uh, George Washington University. Didn't realize you were so accomplished, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> and, and numerous certifications from the Defense Acquisition University. He's a retired naval aviator and Department of Defense Acquisition professional with over 25 years of experience in flight operations, test and evaluation, systems engineering, program management, and strategic planning, including involvement in government uh, procurement programs. He's flown over 45, uh, 4,500 hours in uh, several fixed and rotary wing aircraft. Uh, please join me in welcoming J.C. Coffey. Thanks, John. Now, I'm just going to wander a little bit around as, uh, as I give my chat. Um, uh, I have a pretty good background in both the DOD side and the civilian side, uh, representing the government and other agencies, the commercial side, and also I work very closely with academia when it comes to uh, unmanned systems. And, and what I've found across the spectrum is how we've been spreading these things so quickly, so prolifically, how inevitable it is that they're going to spread but then how thoughtful we are at spreading these, okay? So um, some folks asked earlier, hey, what, what can you do to, uh, to help out in getting the word out, moving things forward? Know that on Capitol Hill, th this is getting a lot of attention. AUVSI is up there all the time. Uh, we have a brand new CEO with AUVSI, Brian Wynn, and he is terrific at working the hill and, uh, and pushing the agenda. Uh, I worked very closely with most of the guys in the room on the panel here and, and the last panel on, uh, on advocate, uh, uh, being advocates for this stuff and also setting the agenda for what we're pushing. Um, it, it's interesting, just a few years ago at NOAA, uh, there was a lot of pushback on unmanned systems. I mean, uh, the leadership did not embrace this initially. Uh, we have a number of manned aircraft, you know, of our hurricane hunters that are down in Tampa. Uh, we also use twin otters to, to go out and count whales. and and uh, spot, uh, do coastal surveys using King Air. So we have, we have a lot of different mission sets that we use with, uh, aircraft for. Uh, but, but replacing those aircraft with unmanned systems wasn't very exciting to folks. But now we're starting to build a case for it. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, our leadership, uh, the NOAA administrator, is uh, Dr. Catherine Sullivan. She's a naval aviator and also an astronaut. So she gets it. She has a, a NASA background. She has a, a Navy background, DOD background, and now in charge of NOAA. And she, she was at NOAA uh, years ago. Our, our chief scientist, uh, Dr. Spinrad, he also is very interested in robotics and unmanned systems. Uh, so, so the agenda's starting to move along, and, and we've been uh, having quite a, quite a bit of luck. Um, so next slide, please. So you, you've seen this. Uh, before, uh, and again, you know, the, it's $84 billion, 700 or, or 70,000 new jobs. And uh, I want you guys to get a piece of that. And I'm going to tell you how to do it. We're going to, no one needs help. NASA needs help. Um, we're trying to do work down here in Florida. We're very successful flying down here in Florida, and we want to continue to do that. And we don't have enough assets. Uh, what we're finding through a lot of analysis across the government spectrum is most of the work's going to be outsourced because we just can't, we can't do it internally. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough uh, uh, folks to keep an eye on it. Training programs are expensive. Uh, the data management piece is overwhelming us. I mean, the White House just put out some data management policies, and we're all trying to follow them, but I, I got to tell you, we're overwhelmed uh, on the Global Hawk. 
Our Global Hawk, uh, we're in a partnership with NASA. And there's five Global Hawks out in Dryden, now Armstrong. And, and we've been flying them over and around hurricanes. Uh, so I put together a data management plan for the Global Hawk, all the data we're getting back around these hurricanes. And I asked the guys from DOD, hey, do you have a data management plan for your Global, global Hawks? And the Navy and, and the Air Force didn't. Uh, NASA hadn't had one. So we put together one. And we're getting so much data, we don't know what to do with it. We, we can't place, uh, find places to archive it. So you know, these are the kind of things that you know, we, we think about flying this, the UASs and how neat it is as an aviator. I'm all about it. But ultimately, we're out there for a reason. I'll talk to you a little bit about some of those reasons. So, so you guys have seen this. You know this. This is the, the background. There's, there's uh, plenty of opportunity out there. I'm hoping you, you all take advantage of it. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, it started with the four Ds, right? And, and if you're in the industry, you know the four Ds. Uh, it, it's funny because when I brief at other places, I'm, I'm a brief, uh, I go up to Penn State and, and teach a class up there every once in a while, and I'm like, hey, who's heard of the four Ds? Does everybody know of four Ds of unmanned systems? And, and very few people actually know it. So as advocates out there, you, know, you start from the very beginning. Where we use these? The dull, the dirty, the dangerous, the denied missions. For DOD, that was very simple, right? Because uh, we can walk through them. But, but for us, there's denied places. The Arctic is a denied place. It's hard to get a manned aircraft up there. Uh, this graphic down here, this shows all the tracks that we flew the Global Hawk last year. So uh, we flew out of Wallops Island, Virginia. We consider flying out of KFC, by the way, and I think that, that's an interesting uh, possibility for the future. But we flew uh, 11 events, 265 flight hours. We dropped 665 sons. So drop signs from 65,000 feet, which ends up being about 300 uh, data hours, SON data. And what we're finding is it's, it, it's greatly improving our forecasting, being able to have in situ measurements, getting on top of that hurricane or out in front of the hurricane, drop our SONs, and it, it, we can figure out the intensity and track with a lot more accuracy. That's important to you guys here in Florida, isn't it? So uh, that's one of our, our big areas. So why are we using these? So you go from the four Ds to the four Es. Why do we want to use them? And, and a lot of people argue this, but what we're finding, you see our Puma uh, down in the bottom uh, picture there. We, we fly uh, that off of our research vessels. And we, in uh, 2012, we acquired two systems through the Army. Uh, we paid for them. And we've been flying the wings off of them. And two years later, out of the six aircraft we had, only one is, uh, is broken, and we're going to get that fixed. But hundreds of events, hundreds of flight hours, millions of photos from the Arctic down to the equator, we're just, we're just flying, flying, flying. And it's ended up, we're, we're down around $10 per event. That's how much it costs. So we charge up the batteries, but that's the cost. Now, what drives our unmanned industry? It's the cost of the manpower, isn't it? And what really drives it is the travel expense. So if I have to get my guys from Tampa, to fly to Alaska to do events. That's plane tickets, that's per diem, that's hotels, everything else. So, so you'll see me talk about it a little bit uh, later on, but having organic operators is, is crucial. You need, you need the local boys. Don't, don't hire a guy in Key West to fly out of uh, a Liktok Point, Alaska. You know, get Alaskans to fly in Alaska and get, get Floridians to fly out of Florida. So uh, uh, I think that's, that's a big point for us. So that, the efficiency and the effectiveness of it only comes when you use local guys. On the aircraft carrier, there's no bunk space. On our research vessel, no bunk space. So we have to train our sailors to operate these things. We don't, we don't want to bring additional guys on board. Um, at, on when we're land-based operations, we're finding we should outsource it more, more and more. So if, uh, if you're in the business, uh, we're here to hire. Uh, I talked about the economics of it and then environmentally friendly. Um, uh, earlier on, Paul talked to you about using iron uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cells to fly a Scan Eagle. Uh, the Naval Research Laboratory flew the Iron Tiger for 36 hours on a couple of drops of hydrogen and the exhaust water, right? Pretty incredible stuff. Uh, and then we can't get close enough to our whales using manned aircraft. If you try to fly a helicopter over a whale, he'll go deep. But if you fly an electric quadcopter, hexcopter, 
we can get up and close. I, I, I'm sure if you Google Noah Wales, you'll come up with extravagant photos with, uh, with us doing research um, using quadcopters and, and hexacopters. And then um, finally, the why now. So here's our global hawk that's, that's landing in uh, at Wallops Field. And we'll be out there again this year. Uh, this, uh, one of the weeks in September, we set a new record. 765 hours in a week uh, with the Navy, Air Force, and NOAA, NASA Global Hawks. Pretty good, right? Almost a thousand an hour a week. There's 49 Global Hawks in the world. We have five of them. Um, again, it's a single engine jet. So what's so sexy about that, right? I mean, I look at that and that's an F-16 to me right up until the command and control piece, right? That's the hard part, the KU satellite, making sure you have good link. Um, when we're flying from either California or Virginia and we're off the coast of, of Africa, you gotta wrap your mind around that a little bit. And we're up for 24 hours. So you come to work in the morning, we, and I'll give you guys the, the web link where you can watch us fly. We take off on a Monday morning, the thing's still flying Tuesday as it's, uh, as it's coming back. Uh, as we fly over and around the hurricane. So um, why now? It's, uh, if you're uh, in the aviation business, you know for the last 100 years, the, the, um, the, the pacing item has always been propulsion, right? The Wright brothers got up first because they figured out a lightweight propulsion system. We're doing the same thing, aren't we? We, we get good battery density now, uh, light rate, lightweight and reliable uh, motors that are affordable. So, you know, now is the time. We, got, we can put a lot of power on a very small vehicle. Um, the computing power, how much we can, we can uh, compute on board and then push down. Miniaturization of sensors. We're all looking at the same thing. EO, IR, uh, SAR, LIDAR, and hyperspectral. I mean, that's DOD guys, us guys, everybody. It's the same suite. But now we're looking at radars that used to weigh 1,000 pounds. Now they're down to two pounds. Very sophisticated SAR radars down to two pounds, amazing. Uh, the affordability is a big piece. And then finally, I tell people all the time, it, it's really, it's a simple business, but it's not easy. There's three things. You need an airworthy aircraft, airworthy operators, and airspace. And out of those three things, what's the hardest? Airspace, right? And we're getting there. I mean, we're getting there. But we're, we have great access to vehicles now, great access to operators, so we just gotta keep pushing the airspace and, and we will get there. Next slide. So uh, here are all the different things we do. I'm just gonna highlight, uh, we're flying Pumas off the icebreaker Healy. And that's us up in the Arctic uh, last year. Uh, we were there in 2013, we'll be there again uh, we're there in 2014. We're going to be there again this summer. Um, we have a great relationship with the Coast Guard. We're also going to fly Scan Eagles out of uh, Wainwright this summer uh, with the Navy. And we're going to fly our Global Hawk up around the Arctic Circle probably around October, November of this year. So we have a lot of work going on in the Arctic. Um, I recommend to all you guys that you want to find that dull mission. You want to get into doing agriculture, doing maritime surveys, and, and just practice, go out there, get the usable data, coastal surveys, that's important to us. Our sanctuaries need to be monitored, that's important. Because you're not gonna be able to fly in that emergency response scenario, in that search and rescue scenario, disaster relief, you're not gonna be able to get in there for that event-driven event unless you're practiced in it. Unless everybody in the FAA knows you, they're familiar with the way you operate, they trust you, they know your, your platform, uh, and you have personal relationships with the guys around here. So uh, there's a number of great companies that are, uh, that are very, very engaged uh, and, and pushing the envelope for us down here in Florida. And I continue to, to coax them on to do that. We really appreciate that at NOAA, that, that we're getting more and more access to airspace. Uh, next slide. Okay, so here's my problem. Okay, here's my problem that I have 122 different weather offices in the United States. And we have 14 National Marine sanctuaries. And oh, by the way, we just opened up a sanctuary that goes from uh, Kailua all the way out to Midway. 
380,000 square kilometers. And uh, there's poaching op activity that goes on there, illegal activity that goes on there, people going on the islands out there, all no-nos. But there's no way for us to monitor it. So, you know, we talk about using scan eagles or um, uh, using predators or stuff like that that can stay out there for days and just fly up and down the chain. And if we see a, a boat come up to the limit and turn off its AIS, we know that they may be doing something, but let's go down and take a picture of them. So that, that, this is my problem, how, how much work we have to do, and we just don't have enough guys, right? And as I said, we need our folks to have local operators and local people helping us out. Um, so this is something that we've come up with, target autonomous in situ sensing and rapid response, okay? So, so in Oklahoma, they don't worry too much about hurricanes. They do worry about tornadoes every day. And what we'd like to do is set up a network. We have a number of fixed sites there uh, that do a pretty good job uh, giving us tornadic warnings. We're down to, we can figure out in about two hours whether we're gonna get a tornado or not. And then we're able to push the button about 13 minutes out, 13 minutes from the tornado. The problem is we have a lot of false positives. So we see it, we, we think it's building, we think it's building, we hit the horn, everybody goes to the shelter, but then it doesn't hit. After a while, people stop going to the shelter, right? So we have a real problem with that. So what we want to do is get some in situ readings. And, and the, the current systems we have, space-based and, and land fix sites, we, we're not getting any better data than that. We're not going to improve our forecasting with the current observation strategy. But this may help out where I could be sitting in my weather office, and all of a sudden, I see the atmospherics that, that tornadoes are right behind. So I hit the button. And we have vertical takeoff and landing platforms autonomously flying. So one operator flying dozens of these things. When the fuel low light comes on, when the battery low light comes on, it just goes back into the doghouse, recharges, and does it again. At the same time, I have fixed wing aircraft that are going around and kind of connecting the dots. We call that the picket fence. The platform you see up here, this platform was uh, raised by balloon up to 65,000 feet. And you can't really see too great under it, but there's two small UASs called Cicada that were uh, invented at the Naval Research Laboratory. They're the size of DVD discs. The flight control system, the autopilot, all the sensing equipment is built right onto the wings. So it, it's a flying circuit board. They cost about $500 to produce right now. I told them to knock a zero off, and we'll shoot 1,000 of these things out of a Predator or a or Global Hawk, all right? So, uh, that's part of our strategy. You know, once we see things building, we'll start launching inexpensive platforms up to 65,000, up to 100,000 feet, and then we'll release them and guide them into the areas we want to fly. I mean, we're not flying in tornadoes and manned aircraft, right? But these are certainly things. $50 a pop, we can afford that and put it into a tornado. So uh, a couple things, again, plenty of weather business here in Florida. Hurricanes, flooding, doing some work with Peoria to do, uh, Brian, to do um, for our river forecasting centers. Uh, part, part of the National Weather Service, we have 13 river forecasting centers, uh, and we, we predict floods. We help out the Army Corps of Engineers if a flooding event occurs, and we see that we might need to open a levee. Our scientists help out, tell them which locations we need to, to take down. So these are the kind of things that we work on in NOAA. But, I uh, really appreciate the guys from Peoria helping us out uh, up in Jacksonville on that. And of course, you know, uh, the Sanctuary Mission Key West, we have a big piece of water down there. There is poaching operations going on down there. How many, been, how many people have been in Key West? Okay, so, so we do an operation down there, and some of our guys, um, after the mission, they're down at Sloppy Joe's having a beer. And one of the guys goes, hey, what are you guys doing down here? I'm like, oh, we're flying drones, keep an eye on our sanctuary. Next couple of days, poaching oppor opportunities <laughs> went way down. <laughs> so you had that deterrence effect, right? I mean, we're flying a puma, not armed, but just when people think they're being watched, st things start stopping. So just the deterrence effect was huge for us. Um, so plenty of opportunity. Next slide, I'm just going to finish up real quick. This is a summary. Um, you guys know most of this stuff. I want to talk to you uh, on the breaks and wherever else. Uh, please let me know about your technology. Again, being, having an NRL background, 
you know, I tell people this is nothing new. We've been doing unmanned systems for a century. Been doing this for a hundred years. So what's the big deal right now? It's because it's so prolific, right? So we're, we're all getting a lot of stuff up there uh, and we're clobbering the airspace. We just want to be thoughtful about it. So thanks and I'll be uh, looking for your questions.